Here you see a depiction of the death of Socrates by Du Fresnoy from the 17th century. Uh, so we see Socrates in the prison cell, surrounded by his friends, getting ready to drink the hemlock, his friends losing all composure whilst he seems to be uh, perfectly in control. Here you see Socrates uh, again in his prison cell getting ready to drink the hemlock, his friends surrounding him losing all composure. Uh, back here you see Xantippe, his wife, being led away, which Plato also mentions in the Phaedo because apparently she was acting too hysterically, so Socrates wanted her removed from his prison cell. Oh, this last one was by Jacques-Louis David, uh, painted in 1787. Now, returning to the political interpretation, which I mentioned earlier, as holding that the official impiety charge was trumped up, that the real reasons underlying his death were political. What do proponents of this interpretation mean by saying that the real reasons underlying his death were political? Well, one way to motivate this interpretation is to read the text in such a way that they reveal anti-democratic leanings in Socrates himself and perhaps also his tendency to try to uh, spread these views to those who congregated around him. In particular, his contemporaries might have thought him to be anti-democratic by being pro-oligarchic and specifically pro-Spartan. So we get the two claims, which I've called A and B. Either Socrates, in fact, was himself anti-democratic, pro-oligarchic, pro-Spartan, or at least he was perceived to pose a threat to the Athenian democracy. Now, two pieces of evidence are often appealed to by the supporters of this interpretation. One is the two recent overthrows of the democracy that happened fairly close to his death. So there was the first by the so-called 400 in 411 BC, and the second by the so-called 30 in 404 BC. And there may have been other attempts at overthrowing the democracy in the works while so right around the time that Socrates was brought to trial. So the Athenians are thought to have become jittery and insecure about the stability of their democracy, and they may have uh, thought that everyone who, who was perceived as some kind of threat to the democracy deserved to be viewed with suspicion or worse. If you wonder why, if this is the case, the Athenians didn't just bring up Socrates on explicitly political charges, usually what's pointed out in response to this is that the Athenians passed some kind of amnesty in 403 or 402 BC after following the second oligarchic revolution, which would have prohibited anyone other than the very leaders of these revolutions to be brought up on explicitly political charges for anything that happened prior to that date. I also mentioned uh, that there were some notorious troublemakers who congregated around Socrates, in particular Alcibiades, Critias, and Carmides. In the symposium, Alcibiades is depicted, and in, also in other places, is depicted as being involved in some kind of romantic relationship with Socrates. Uh, Critias and Carmides both appear in Platonic dialogues and get sympathetic treatment from Plato, who was also himself related to them. All three of them went on to make trouble for themselves. All of them were known for their, their anti-democratic, pro-oligarchic, pro-Spartan sympathies. Critias and Carmides were themselves involved in the bloody overthrow of the Thirty, and Alcibiades at certain points in his life defected to Athens' enemies and plotted against the city. Here is a sculpture of Alcibiades, who was supposed to have been extremely handsome. And here you see a painting called Socrates dragging Alcibiades from the arms of voluptuous pleasure. 
Um, this is by Jean-Baptiste Reignan, painted in 1791. So you see that even during the 1700s, 1800s, and so forth, Socrates' death was a very prominent theme, so it's not as though, uh, you know, no one has worried about this, and now we're asking these questions again. This has been uh, of continued interest to artists and philosophers, among others. Okay, now here's what I actually want to argue for. So it seems to me that there's evidence against what I've called claim A, which was that we should attribute anti-democratic, pro-oligarchy, pro-Spartan sentiments to Socrates himself based on Plato's early Socratic texts. That claim seems to me not to stand up very well when we look at these texts. Uh, but this is not to say that claim B is not plausible, that the Athenians perceived him to pose a threat to the democracy. So on my reading of these early Platonic dialogues, Socrates does not actually subscribe to a positive political philosophy. <clears throat> so we should read him as neither explicitly democratic nor explicitly anti-democratic. When he endorses rule by the one who knows, or the expert, and I'll show you some passages where he does that in a second, we should not read this as an endorsement of oligarchy or some other version of rule by the few. Rather, on my reading, the Socratic mission is primarily aimed at establishing the preconditions for expertise in ruling, namely moral virtue or knowledge of what is good and bad. Now let's consider a representative passage, this one from the Lakeys, in which Socrates argues that when making a decision, we should prefer what the expert has to say over what the majority has to say. So he says, so I think it is by knowledge that one ought to make decisions, if one is to make them well, and not by majority rule. So in this present case, where they're discussing the education of children in particular, whether they should learn uh, how to fi fight with arms, in this present case, it is also not necessary to investigate, first of all, whether any, uh, sorry, it is also necessary to investigate, first of all, whether any one of us is an expert in the subject we are debating or not. And if one of us is, then we should listen to him, even if he's only one, and disregard the others. So this is an example of the kind of passage you might point to if you favor the political interpretation. Now, my first claim just now was that we should read the early Platonic dialogues without recognizing in Socrates an explicit, an explicit commitment to a positive political philosophy. But of course, some commentators would disagree with me on this. For example, Gregory Vlastos has tried to argue on the basis of Plato's Crito that Socrates felt a deep-seated love for the laws of Athens and that we should therefore interpret him as pro-democratic. There are problems with this line of reasoning. For one thing, Plato's Crito reports an imaginary conversation between a personified version of the laws of Athens and Socrates, and the loyalty and commitment that Socrates seems to exhibit towards the laws of Athens can be, I think, mostly divorced from the content of these laws, in particular their role in underwriting a democratic society. So I don't think relying on the Crito is necessarily a promising strategy when one is arguing, trying to argue that uh, Socrates should be read as pro-democratic. Turning now to the anti-democracy side, there are definitely lots of passages that one can point to in favor of this reading. So as I just mentioned, the rule by the one who knows slogan might be taken to point towards some kind of oligarchic political agenda. But here we have to keep in mind, as I mentioned earlier, that Socrates, 
does not recognize either in himself or in the people he comes across the kind of knowledge that he thinks is required for expertise and ruling. So nobody who's actually in the position to make political decisions has the requisite expertise. And so, if anything, one might think that Socrates would be critical of any actual form of government, whether democratic or oligarchic. Of course, we wonder how in that case we are supposed to live together at all. Uh, but I think that Socrates just wasn't terribly interested in these practical questions, and he was more concerned with and saw it as his special divine mission to help people, including himself, put on, go on the path of uh, pursuing moral virtue, which I think is just a prerequisite for expertise in ruling. So the, in the interpretation I favor is neither, that he should be read as neither pro-democratic nor anti-democratic. Uh, 